So thanks to all of you for coming today, Braving the Rain. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today two of my colleagues, Abi Ladd and Satya Kanduri. And they're going to be talking about search quality at LinkedIn. And it's going to really be in two major parts. Abi is going to talk about query understanding. It's a special place in my heart since that is my team. And uh, he's going to talk to you about the various ways in which we essentially process and analyze queries to understand the user's intent. And then Satya is going to talk about ranking with a particular emphasis on the sort of personalized machine learned ranking that's unique to, to the way that LinkedIn's uh, search challenges work. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Abi to talk about query understanding. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm going to start, talk about query understanding at LinkedIn. To ensure that we provide the best possible search experience to our users, it's very important that we understand what they want to search for when they type in a query. So just to give you an example, suppose you search for query understanding at LinkedIn. We want to use all the information that we have about the query as well as about the searcher to decide whether you're looking for people with that title at LinkedIn, or you're looking for jobs with that particular uh, requirement, or looking for blog posts or something else. We also want to understand whether you have a single result in mind, or is this just an exploratory query? We also want to identify entities in the query. And what else do we know about those entities? For example, LinkedIn is a company. We know where it is, we know which industry it belongs to, and so on. So today I want to talk about how we do all these different things at LinkedIn. So to, before we proceed, let's take a step back and quickly look at what are the different search use cases at LinkedIn. That is, how do people use LinkedIn search? So the most, uh, the frequent use case on LinkedIn is people search, as you would expect. Uh, that is, finding other people so that you can connect to them, follow them, message them, or hire them, and so on. And the most common way to do that is searching for people by their name. So in this case, Barack Obama. And you get the profile for Barack. Uh, you could also look for people by other attributes. For example, their job title. So for example, Pandora Chief Scientist. And we should be able to find the correct person for you. Or you could be a recruiter doing an exploratory search. That is, you don't have a particular person in mind, but you just want to find all people in your network who have a particular skill. For example, information retrieval. So people are just one of the entities you can find. Obviously, there are other things like job postings. For example, you enter a query web developer, and we want to give you a ranking of job postings. That makes sense for you. Uh, you could be looking for companies by their name or by other attributes like big data. For example, you want to find out companies that are working in a particular field, and so on. So these are just some of the entities. Obviously, there's much more. Uh, you could be looking for groups, universities, blog posts, articles, and so on. And our goal in the search team is that we want to explore, we want to make all of this content available to you in a single unified search interface. By, by that I mean give you a single search box where you enter your query without having to fiddle around with a lot of controls to tell us what exactly you're looking for. We want our results to have high recall. So you should be able to enter your query easily without having to worry about spellings or synonyms and so on. And we should be able to, if, if what you're looking for is in the index, we should be able to retrieve it for you. We also want our results to have high precision, something we call entity-oriented search. The idea being, instead of treating your query like a bunch of words that we blindly ma match against everything in the index, we want to first understand what every word in the query means. Is it an entity that we already know about so that we can do a very precise match with the documents uh, and give you accurate results. So now I want to talk about how we accomplish all of that. So let's walk through the query understanding pipeline at LinkedIn. So there are uh, once you enter your raw query, that is your string in the search box, there are various things that happen to the query before it is actually sent to the index for retrieval. And I'm going to cover all of these. And the goal here is twofold. First of all, we want to take your raw query and convert it into a structured form that is more likely to have good recall and precision when it hits the index. The second goal is to also generate, as part of query understanding, 
some annotations or hints that can be used by the scorer to more intelligently rank results. So I'm going to today talk about four main things that we do to the query uh, before it hits the index. Uh, the first thing is uh, obviously spell check because if there's any spelling errors in the query, we don't want uh, the, uh, to negatively impact the downstream analysis. I'll talk more about that. The second thing is uh, query tagging, which is identifying entities in the query that we know about. And third is vertical intent prediction. So the, if you want to provide you with a single search box and figure out uh, what exactly you're looking for, we need to predict intent based on the query as well as other attributes that we know about you. And finally, query expansion. That is uh, ensuring that the query gets good recall. So let's start with spell check. So the goal of spell check is obvious. We want to fix typos in the query. But more importantly, we also want to help you spell names, which are inherently harder to spell because of there are so many variations or because of language differences. So this shouldn't come as a surprise to most of you who have uh, worked with spell check. Uh, so this is how we do spell check at LinkedIn. Um, we start with the corpus of uh, people names, companies, titles from all the profile data that we have uh, about members, and also past query logs. And we extract three main features uh, from that. Uh, the first is n-grams, which is basically sequences of uh, consecutive characters in, the, in any given token. And then you create an inverted index out of that, which is a very standard way to uh, index tokens so that you can efficiently find words which are close in edit distance to each other by just looking for words that have maximal overlap of these n-grams uh, with the given word. The second thing is metaphone. Uh, you might be uh, familiar with soundex. Uh, this is very similar. So the idea is to map similar sounding words to the same hash. And this comes in very handy when we are trying to autocorrect spelling errors in names. Uh, because many times you're not uh, sure whether the, the person you're looking for uses a C in their name or a K, or they have a single T or a double T and so on. So metaphone is a way to map all these different variations of names that sound similar to each other to a single uh, hash value so that, it, so that you can efficiently find them. Finally, we also use uh, co-occurrence counts, which is how often do any given pair of words co-occur together in people's profiles or in past queries. So this allows us to do contextual spelling correction uh, when the query has two or more words. So suppose you have already seen the word Marissa and Yahoo in a query. You know that the likely spelling for Meyer is M-A-Y-E-R instead of M-E-Y-E-R, which is, uh, by the way, more common in our corpus in of itself. So that spell check, uh, uh, one of the problems we face, uh, faced while we were developing this is that the corpus, which is all the profiles that people have filled out manually, as well as the query logs, have spelling errors themselves. So we want to, we want to avoid putting that in the index and suggesting bad spelling errors to, the, to people. So just to give you an example, uh, almost 80,000 people have misspelled product manager on their profile. And it's a misspelling, but it's very frequent. But on the other hand, there are many genuine words, uh, especially names, which are correctly spelled, but they are qu quite in infrequent and rare, just because of the long tail distribution of names. And we want to obviously distinguish between these cases. So one way we, we solve this problem is uh, by, using, by doing query log analysis. So basically use query chains and look for patterns like how many times people started with a query and immediately reformulated it to something else and then proceeded to a click. So for example, we see that uh, quite often product manager is reformulated to product manager and then it gets a click from the user. So we are pretty confident that manager is a spelling error for manager, even when manager is a valid English word as well as a French word. <laughs> So uh, that's one, one uh, pattern. The other pattern is obviously look for names that are rare in the corpus, but when they occur in the query, they immediately proceed to a click. So we know that these are rare but correct spellings. Um, so that about, that's about spelling. Uh, next, I want to talk about query tagging, which is a very important component of uh, query understanding at LinkedIn. So the idea of query tagging is given a query which is just a sequence of words from the user, we want to break it down into logical units and identify what every unit means. For example, in this case, software engineer is a title, Google is a company, New York is a location. But we also want to go one step further 
and link these tags to actual entities that we know about, know more about. For example, this title software engineer could actually be linked to this entire cluster of other software engineers, software developers, and programmers. And obviously, you can imagine we can use this kind of information to do query expansion, for example. This, uh, similarly, for companies, we know what this, uh, we know that Google is a company, but we also know more about it, which industry it belongs to, what is its canonical name, and so on. Similarly, for locations, we know the country, we know longitude, latitude, so that we can do range queries, and so on. And we, we can obviously identify other tags, like names, uh, uh, schools, uh, also skills, because they occur a lot in queries. So the main idea behind doing this query tagging is that we can do more precise matching with documents when we see such a query. So in this case, we want to make sure that software engineer actually matches with a person who lists software engineer as their position, similarly for company and for location. Uh, so that person should actually be in New York. It should not, not be a person who just happened to mention New York somewhere in their profile. So this is especially useful to prevent bad results from showing up. For example, you start with the query deep nishar. Thanks to ranking, we see that the first result is the correct one. But at the same time, you do see a lot of bad results follow up, and that does nothing but confuse the user, because they happen to mention these two words somewhere in their profile. So with entity-based filtering, what you can do is make sure you only show the correct content, uh, correct content and nothing else for queries. And this becomes even more useful when you are trying to look for someone who doesn't exist on LinkedIn. Suppose your query is John Russo Verizon. If we don't have this kind of entity-based filtering, we'll end up doing best effort ranking, and you see results that uh, are really not relevant. For example, you see a person whose last name is Russo. She went to St. John's. That's why it's showing up. But it's better to immediately tell the user that the person they are looking for is not present rather than waste their time. And so that they can take corrective action, like invite the person or do something else. So this is, I think this is one example where less is more. We don't want to waste the user's time with best effort ranking if we are pretty sure what they're looking for is not in the index. And, and this goes a long way towards increasing precision by using entities. So I'm going to talk about how we do, uh, I'm going to give a high-level picture of how we do in uh, query tagging. So uh, one, also, one another thing that we do, and we are doing this now um, more recently, and this might be in beta right now, so it's not uh, available to everyone, is also using query tagging to do more intelligent query suggestions as you type. So for example, if you start typing link, we know it's pretty likely to complete to LinkedIn. But we also know LinkedIn is a company, so we can use that information to give you more intelligent suggestions like look for jobs at LinkedIn, or look for people who work there or have uh, worked there before. And when you, when you select one of these suggestions, we convert it to a structured query. In this case, a faceted query so that it's, it's, it matches the right content and nothing else. So yeah, and now I'm going to talk about uh, how, uh, briefly about how we uh, do this. So query tagger basically is a sequential prediction model, an HMM, uh, which most of you might be familiar with. And when you're training such a model, you're basically learning two things. One is the emission probabilities, which is basically the language model for every tag. That what kind of words are, tend to occur in certain, as certain tags or certain fields. And we use profiles to do that. So for, uh, just to give an example, we basically see how many times GE occurs as a first name versus as a company name and turn all of this into probabilities. The second thing you want to learn is transition probabilities, which is what is the general order in which tags occur? So again, we use uh, past query logs to learn uh, what is the general order in which people specify things in the query, like first names before last names in, in many languages, and then other attributes like companies or titles and so on. So this is the training part. Uh, at runtime, you're basically doing inference. Given a query, you're trying to find out what is the most likely sequence of tags which has the highest likelihood, given the probabilities you have learned uh, at, uh, during training. Tra sorry. Training data is coming from past uh, queries to learn the sequences that people generally use in queries uh, when they're specifying uh, sequences of words. And then we also use profiles, because then it tells us what words tend to occur in which fields. So that gives us a sense of uh, what the query would mean. 
Um, there are automated means that we, that, that we use for cleaning up data, uh, like using click data to understand whether the result is a spam, for example, because if you start turning on everything, sometimes you will get all kinds of stuff because people are abusing uh, LinkedIn for, say, marketing, putting things like Facebook in their names and so on. So we want to avoid that. We do some things there based on click patterns. Uh, so as I said, uh, basically click patterns. So looking at what kind of results tend to get clicked or skipped, that is one kind of signal. And many other that, some of them are not publicly disclosed, obviously, for, uh, when you are dealing with spam. But that's the general idea. Yeah. So right now, um, most of our query understanding stack is uh, language agnostic. So we have not really moved in that direction yet. But as we go into more countries, that is something that we do want to take care of. Because yes, a lot of these things, even query tagging, depends a lot on the language, how people specify different things in different cultures and so on. So yeah, yeah. but we, we are that, not there yet. Yeah, so basically right now the model is an HMM. So yeah, so we're basically learning two things there, as I said, the, pro the language model for every tag and the transition probabilities of how people specify, tend to specify things in queries. So those are the two things. We are not using a CRF right now, but uh, I think it does make sense to consider uh, improving the model and using more context from the query as well as other uh, attributes that you might know about the user uh, in that model. But right now it's an HMM model. So the third thing uh, that I want to talk about is vertical intent prediction, which is given a query, how can we decide what, what kind of entities you're looking for, whether you're looking for people, jobs, companies, and so on. So for example, if you type a fairly ambiguous query like product manager, we want to use all the information about this query as well as about your past behavior to infer a probability distribution on different verticals, like you are most likely looking for jobs, you might also be looking for people and very unlikely to be looking for companies. So to do this, uh, we use various signals. So one of the things is just query counts from the past. So how many times have we seen a particular query in each vertical? For example, how many times have you seen product managers show up in job search versus in people search and so on? <clears throat> And, uh, but these counts often get very uh, uh, sparse because of the uh, long tail distribution of queries. So one of the things we also do is also look at query tags. So uh, pay attention to this example here. Uh, so there are two queries on, uh, on the left side you have Edward Jones. On the right side there's a very similar qu query, it's Ed Jones. But our query tagger is able to distinguish between them and tag Edward Jones as a company and Ed Jones as a person. So we can use that information to optimally blend results. So once you know it's a company on the left side, you can have, you can show the company page to the user, some of the employees working there, job postings and so on. If you know it's a name, then you can show name search. And obviously you can see, even for the right, right, right hand side, Edward Jones does retrieve, Ed, Ed Jones does actually retrieve Edward Jones also because we do synonymic, synonym expansion there for names. Good question. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to again talk a little bit more about that. I did talk about that a little bit in spelling where we try to use reformulation data to decide whether something is a genuinely correct word or are you just, uh, is that just a spelling error or something else? So, but again, I'll talk about that in uh, query expansion because that's the second place where it, uh, it comes in very handy. And finally, we also use personalization features here. Uh, to, for example, you can fall back to your, your profile. For example, are you a recruiter versus a student? or have you done a lot of job searches recently to, to get a sense of what to show for ambiguous cases? Got a question. So there was a request, there's a request to come to the mic to ask questions because this session is being recorded and streamed live. I see. I'll also try to repeat. Okay. So finally, uh, let's talk about query expansion. So you already saw how we can use the query tagger to provide more 
results with higher precision. That is, we can use the entity-based filtering to make sure we only match against the right content. So query expansion solves the other half of the problem, which is how to ensure that results have high recall. There's often a vocab vocabulary mismatch between what you type in the query box and what terms are used uh, in the result you're looking for. So one example of this, which happens a lot, is name search. So you can never be sure whether the person you're looking for has used their abbreviated name or the full name or a nickname to, to uh, list themselves. So we are able to resolve, for example, John to Jonathan, which is an abbreviation there, and also nicknames like James and Jamie. Similarly, this comes in handy for job title synonyms. So there are so many different job titles uh, where basically they mean the same thing, programmer, software engineer, software developer, and so on. Similarly, lawyers, attorneys, and so on. So we don't want you to spend your time trying to create long queries and automatically expand to those uh, synonyms. So in this example, if you type programmer, without doing expansion, you get about 1,200 results. But once you do that, you not only get more results, but better results, because many of the relevant content might not actually say programmer. It might say developer, web developer, or software engineer, and so on. So just quickly, um, how we actually train this. So again, uh, coming back to your question. So basically, we look at query chains and see how many times we see certain uh, reformulations repeated. So this is one way of using it, but to answer your question, it can also be used to detect where something is a wrong query and not likely to be, not likely to retrieve any good high quality result set. So for example, if we see John go to Jonathan a lot of times, so programmer to developer, software engineer to software developer, we can learn these patterns uh, from data. So you, yeah, sorry. Um, so you mean learning uh, queries? Yeah. 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 So you might have one query where you you have used type ahead, but you're not satisfied with it. You might still reformulate to something else. So in that case, you might you are, you're right. Some to some extent, we are affecting user behavior by once they type, type soft, we are already suggesting something to them. But I think. The, to some extent, we are also allowing them to reformulate if they're not happy, and we can still record that. Yeah. So, yeah, so I talked about how we use reformulations to detect synonyms, but you must take some care here. These relationships are symmetric, but not transitive. Uh, by that I mean Francis and Frank are the same, Franklin and Frank are the same, but you don't want to infer that Francis is the same as Franklin. Uh, similarly, these are context-based uh, expansions. So you can safely expand software engineer to software developer, but you, you don't want to make the leap that all engineers can be rewritten as developers. Just an example, civil engineers are not civil developers. So you always keep the context in the query in mind when you're expanding. So I just covered all, the four main components of query understanding. Uh, just to summarize before we move on to the next section, uh, which Satya will cover on ranking. So there's a high degree of structure in the queries that we see as well as our corpus, which is people's profiles, companies, uh, job postings, and so on. And query understanding allows us to take advantage of that structure to deliver results with high recall and precision. And finally, the ability to understand as well as rewrite the query is highly dependent at LinkedIn on two things. One is query tagging, which is the ability to identify and extract entities from the query. And secondly, on query log analysis. More specifically, be able to learn from how people reformulate their queries. So with that, I would like to turn over to uh, Satya, Please. who is going to talk Excuse about me. ranking. <laughs> Thank you, Abhi. Um, as uh, some of you are uh, already uh, pointed out, now that we understand your query completely and a lot of heavy lifting is done, all ranking has to do is limit your results to 10, and we are, we are done, right? <laughs> Someone pointed that out. Um, well, it seems that way, but uh, let us take a look at some of the examples to understand uh, what kinds of different ranking challenges we face, even after understanding different entities in the query. For instance, you know that name searches are uh, one of the most common types of queries we see on LinkedIn. And if you look at this example, that name query happens to be Richard Branson. And we have a few Richard Bransons on LinkedIn. But most likely, the searcher or the person who is issuing the search is 
looking for the founder of Virgin Group. So what do we need to get ranking right in this particular case? The first thing we need is that the query terms should match the name clearly. And then if we had some notion of popularity of a person, we just sort the results by the popularity and then we would nail this query. But is that enough? Let us take a look at another example. This is also a name query. And the query happens to be Kevin Scott in this particular case. And these are the result sets that are seen by two different users. So which of these is relevant? Well, if you ask me, I would say the result set on the left is relevant because I work at LinkedIn. But for someone who is working at Home Depot, the result set on the right might be relevant. So there is some aspect of personalization here depending on the company you work in. Is that the only aspect of personalization that we can use? Let's look at it with another example. Let us say I am searching for people working at the company NetApp. So we have the, the top three results have three different dimensions which are highlighted. The first one is relevant to me because I am connected to that person. Whereas for the second one, I may be interested in that result because I live in Bay Area and the profile also happens to be in the Bay Area. However, if you take a look at the third result, he's a second degree connection of mine and he also shares the industry that I am in. That is, he's in computer software and I'm in computer software. So even that result is potentially relevant in my case. So as you can see, apart from the company dimension, we have three more dimensions here for personalization, which is the network distance, your location, and your industry. So now the nat naturally, the thought might be that you take all the dimensions, various dimensions of personalization, and apply them to all queries. And then we can have very good set of results. But that is not always the case. For instance, one of the unique value propositions of LinkedIn is you can search people by their skills. In this particular case, if I'm searching for ballet, and if you look at the top few results, most of those results are in the performing arts industry. And as you might guess, I don't belong to performing arts industry, and I have no skills related to performing arts. So, what this example brings out is using the industry that I work at is not very useful here. So that is a dimension we should ignore for this particular type of query. So to summarize, seemingly similar queries, like the name queries that we saw, require dissimilar scoring functions. And personalization matters and there are a lot of dimensions on which we can personalize upon. I have listed four in the examples, but there are many more. And the dimensions that we personalize on vary depending on the query class. Whether the query contains a scale, whether you're searching by a scale or a name. Or, so depending on the query class, the dimensions differ. Okay, uh, so the question is, uh, how often do we um, do we adjust the ranking? Right. Change your ranking algorithms. Correct. So um, we continuously do a bunch of experiments. So the feedback is not real time in the sense that as soon as you issue the query, uh, we take it and then we start uh, tweaking results for your next query. But uh, we do continuously run experiments and we do a bunch of offline analysis and we keep improving our models. All right, in that backdrop, given all these different challenges, how do we train a machine learning model? How do we train a personalized machine learning model? Um, just a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with machine learning or have worked with machine learning before? Okay, there are quite a few of you. So for those of you who have worked with machine learning before, well, you will see that I'm overly simplifying the flow. But for those of you who haven't worked with machine learning before, roughly there are three pieces into building a model. One is you sample your documents, 
that are potential candidates that you want to put in the training, then you compute the features, and you show them to humans, you get objective judgments, whether those uh, results are relevant or not, and then you put all this data through some machine learning algorithm, and which will give out a model that you know how to evaluate. So that is roughly at the high level. So the techniques to train the model are fairly evolved. Usually, most of the work in building a model goes into getting the training data, which is, you know, you would experiment with multiple sampling strategies, you would experiment with multiple sets of features, and finally, you would have human evaluation to get the labels. So in the next few slides, I will primarily focus on the human evaluation part of it and how that might work in a personalized search scenario. So let us say we pick this query and this result, and we are trying to assess whether this result is relevant or not. Well, if you showed that result to me, I would say, yes, this is relevant, because I'm connected to that person, and he happens to work at Oracle. However, what if the searcher was a job seeker or a recruiter? then clearly the network distance does not matter. And in fact, they might be looking for someone with a skill of Oracle database, not really one who is working at Oracle. So in that sense, this result may or may not be relevant. So the conventional way of thinking about a scoring function is given a query, is this document relevant? But in our case, that is not enough we have to consider query and the user who is issuing the query, and then we try to determine whether this document is relevant or not. So that said, the side effect of that is collecting relevance judgments, like human relevance judgments, will not scale. Because the person who is trying to give an objective judgment on relevance has to keep a lot of context in their head and understand exactly what the searcher was going through to issue an objective judgment. So how do we collect our training data? Well, so we try to get training data based on user behavior. We try to glean some insights from the user behavior that is present in our search logs. And I'll run through a few techniques that might be useful. So the first intuitive approach to collecting training data would be to treat a result that is clicked as relevant and think of everything else as irrelevant. This might work in navigational queries where there is only one right result. So you mark that result as relevant and you treat everything as irrelevant and you might be fine. But what if there are, there's more than one relevant result? We might be unfairly penalizing. So typically, when a user looks at the search results, he's scanning from top to bottom. So in this particular example, all we can fairly say is that the user at least scanned through the top three results. He skipped two, and he clicked one. But beyond that clicked result, we know nothing about the result. We don't even know whether the user saw them and ignored them, or he didn't even see them. So there could be more relevant results in that. So we might be unfairly penalizing some good results that are present after the result that got clicked. So a natural extension to that would be, OK, let's ignore all the results that the user did not see, which we know nothing about, and consider only the results he either skipped or he clicked. So the problem with this approach is that when you train a model based on this data, it learns how to order those top three results. It knows to put the third clicked result before the other two. Because it doesn't know anything about the other results in an extreme case, it might end up putting those irrelevant results on top, but still have the ordering of these three results correct. But they might be somewhere in the middle or at the bottom. Some other irrelevant result might show up at the top. So one way to deal with this issue and also to deal with the position bias is a technique called fair pairs. 
So with fair pairs, what, what we do is, if you think of a result page as 10 results, and imagine there are five pairs, we randomly pick a pair, and you flip the results. And when a user clicks on the result that is below in the pair, that is in the lower order in the pair, then we can say that he looked at the one above and purposely skipped and clicked at the result below. So we can record that preference as the clicked one is good and the skipped one is not good. So this technique deals with the, the model inversion or the problem that we saw before, which is putting relevant results on top. It deals with that. And it is also great at dealing with position bias because we randomly flip the adjacent results. Yes? So the, the thing with dwell time is uh, dwell time becomes tricky when you click, go to the page, and if your information need is satisfied, you might immediately come back, but that doesn't mean that that result is bad. So, correct. Correct. So to give you an example, let us say I was searching for you, and I didn't know where you worked, and I wanted to find out. Let us say the snippet did not show your company. What I would do is I would click your profile and say, oh, okay, this is where he works, and I would immediately come back in less than 10 seconds. That's possible. So it's hard to say that. Uh, so we have to do some experiments. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but, but there are some tricky issues with dwell time. Uh, I'm sorry, so your question is uh, how do we get the pairs? Yeah, so the way we get the pairs is if you have 10 results, there are two ways you can get the pairs, which is you either start at the zeroth result or even numbered result, or you can start at the odd numbered result, right? So with 50% probability, you would pick either. And then once you pick that, you only have five pairs. So you don't consider, so you take the first two, then you take the next two, so you don't intermix between these two. So all these pairs will have equal chance of uh, appearing in the results. All right. So one of the drawbacks of the fair pairs is also that we are focusing too much on the top set of results, according to the current model. Because at the most, we will, most of the time you get data from the first page, and very rarely you get data from the second page, and almost never from the pages beyond. So if you train a model purely on this data, what your model will learn is how to differentiate between good and fair results. Or it will learn how to correct the mistakes of the previous model. But if you throw really bad results at it, it wouldn't know what to do. So one of the ways in which you can handle this problem is by a concept called easy negatives. Well, assuming your current model is not completely random, which is which is more than likely. And you can fairly say that, you know, the current model might put really bad results all the way to the end of the result set. So you could go to the end, pick up a few results, and then inject them into your training data as negatives, which is the really bad results for that particular query. It solves the problem to some extent, but not completely. So imagine that your current model is trained does very well on downgrading the spam results. So it is able to identify spammy profiles and it'll push them all the way to the bottom. So if you take only the last few set of results, all you would see are the spammy profiles. And all your model would learn is how to downgrade spam profiles. But there could be other types of bad results or negative results for this particular query, which our model will not learn. So one way to handle that issue is by using a bias sampling. So one way to do that is, you could say, you know, I would treat the first five pages as relevant results, and everything after that is bad, starting from the sixth page. It is too far down, I would consider those as negatives. So from starting from the sixth page all the way to 100th or 200th page, you can periodically sample results 
so that you cover the entire feature space of the negative results. While doing that, you might also want to prefer, prefer queries with fewer number of results. Let's say you had only 10 pages. Then you can sample better from fifth to 10th page versus you had 100 pages of results. So by doing this bias sampling, you're capturing the feature space for all kinds of negative examples. And now you would inject this into your training set and you would learn how to differentiate between good and bad results along with differentiating how to differentiate between good and fair results. So to summarize, human evaluations are not practical in a personalized searches because it involves a lot of context and it's hard to make an objective evaluation. So we have to learn from user behavior and you could use multiple heuristics, but each of them has your pros and cons. And depending on your need, one approach might suit you better. For instance, fair pairs would suit very well with the re-ranking for those of you who are familiar with the search stack. So now that you have all uh, um, this training data, and then imagine that you put it into some training algorithm, learning algorithm, or package, and you got your model out. So before we put it into production, I would like to quickly comment on the practical considerations that we have to keep in mind, which is the efficiency versus expressiveness. So by efficiency, what I mean is how fast we can evaluate a document with this particular model. And by expressiveness, what I mean is the complexity of the model. So there's a trade-off between these two. Uh, again, once a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the search stack here? We have worked with search. Okay, a few people. So uh, for those of you who haven't worked with a search stack before, you can think of this scoring flow as being very close to where the index is being served. So imagine you have an index that is impossible to uh, fit on one machine, so you would shard them, you would partition them. And then whenever you get a new document, you compute the features, you pass it through your machine learning model, and then you would get a bunch of scores. And then you would sort them by the scores. So if you do this very close to where the index is being served, you're potentially scoring hundreds of thousands of documents. So it is very, very important for this machine learning model to be very fast, and it doesn't have to get the order right. All it has to do is come up with a good candidate set of documents. So once you have a good candidate set of documents, let's say 100 or so, you can have another re-ranking layer which is only looking at those 100 documents and which can be more expressive. It can be more complex and the job of that would be to order these 100 documents in the right order. So in that sense, what we have observed is our trade-off between expressiveness and efficiency is with this model of LR trees. So what this is is we have a tree with some decision nodes and the leaves are logistic regression nodes. So if we limit those decision nodes to query segments and user segments, then we can walk the tree once per query and then we can just use that logistic regression to score a bunch of documents. So let me quickly give you a simplified example of a model that we have. So at the very top, you have a query class name query. If it is a name query, what this model is saying is apply a weight of 0.85 to industry overlap. That means if the person searching and the result, they share the industry, apply a 0.85 weight. However, if it is a skill query, it is instructing to give it a zero weight. So apart from the, the performance optimization of walking the tree down only once, we can do more. Here we clearly see that if it is a skill query, we don't need to compute the industry overlap because anyways the weight is going to zero it out. So we can save some time on not even considering that feature for potential computation. So these are some of the performance considerations we have. So now once you have such a model and you put it in production, then a couple of you have asked me a question on how do you evaluate or test? Well, the conventional way to 
evaluate your models would be to measure click-through rate, you would measure abandonment, you can measure mean reciprocal rank, or you can, in our case, we can measure a bunch of engagement metrics, which is what are the downstream actions that are being taken and things like that. However, there is one additional thing we can do to evaluate the models, any two models side by side. If you take a look at this example, imagine you have two result sets, one from your current model and the green one being your new model. So for every query coming in, you would issue two queries and you would instruct the backend, your index nodes, to use model one in one case, in one request, and the model two in another case. And you get these, both these result sets back and you mix them together in some way. And we, we use some randomization to take care of the position bias, so you would randomly pick one result over the other and then just merge them. So when you do that, what we are essentially doing is we are using the searcher to do a side-by-side -side judgment for us. So imagine just showing these two results sets to the user, and then he's saying, yeah, this is good, this is not good. So we are essentially doing it, but without his knowledge. So what this helps us is over, if we do this for enough number of searches, then we know on an average whether the users are preferring your new model or the control. But there is one additional benefit to this, is that let us say you wanted to understand what the weaknesses of your new model are. This is a great data to dig deeper into your models because when a user sees this result set, he has the exact same context. It doesn't matter what he was doing before, what he does after, or what he's thinking at that moment, but when he sees this result set, all the other context is exactly the same. So you can take a look at it and dig deep and see which of the features are contributing for a result to be up or down and you can understand the weaknesses of your model. And that. So I just want to wrap this up. You know, you've heard a lot uh, in, these, in these two sort of mini talks. Now, Abhi talked about query understanding and really query understanding is part of what's unique, not just about LinkedIn's corpus, but also the sort of structure the information needs. Right? We're able to do query tagging and rewriting to leverage that structured content and the needs and thus uh, get a really nice balance between achieving precision uh, but also recall for those. And the, uh, uh, on the, the other side of this is really uh, the importance that personalization plays. I mean, personalization, as you saw from the, uh, the first of one of the first examples that Satya showed, uh, is a big challenge for us, right? We actually, for many of our queries, if we don't know who you are, we can't return the best result. But it turns out that this is also sort of a big opportunity because we have logged in users, because we know so much about our users, uh, user features turn out to be some of the most important in our ranking. But at the same time, we, we have recognized that uh, we can't necessarily have a single model to rule them all, and recognizing the diversity of needs, we segment our models and, and thus are able to achieve much better results. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of you, both of the speakers, and open the floor again for questions. Thank you.